Well, brethren, as we come this morning to the glorious topic of the Christian security in Christ, I invite you to please turn with me in your Bibles once again to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, picking up in verse 31, and I'll read to verse 34 in your hearing. Romans 8, at verse 31, Paul writes the following and says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Let's once again pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your everlasting and enduring word. We bless you, O God, that your word is truth. And we would pray with our Lord Jesus Christ there in John 17, that you would sanctify us this day in and through this word of truth. Lord, we confess that we need greater measures of sanctification. And so we pray that you would do that in the lives of all of your people here this day. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we come to consider the truths of our text, that you would so work them into our hearts, O oh God, that we would praise your great name. We ask, O oh God, that you would give us wonderful joy this day in our standing in the Lord Jesus. And we pray, O oh Lord, for those among us who do not know you, that this day would be the day of salvation that this would be the day that they would see their desperate need of Jesus Christ, the only Savior of sinners, in whose wonderful name we pray, Amen. In capturing the heart of our passage before us today, the hymn writer named Zinzendorf wrote that glorious hymn that we just sung together entitled, Jesus thy blood and righteousness. This is a hymn that we sing often in this place and in speaking about the final day, the writer says, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Uh, Zinzendorf said, bold shall I stand in thy great day, for who ought to my charge lay? Fully absolved through these I am from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Now, dear ones here this morning, if you are familiar with your Bibles, then you know that this is good theology, to be sure. I mean, here we have solid truths which teach us that because of the sacrificial death and imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to us who believe that on the final day there will in fact be absolutely no condemnation for us who are in him. Well, this morning, we have the Apostle Paul in our passage in view celebrating these grand truths from our text. Here we have Paul even challenging the whole moral universe because of such truths, seeking to see if there is anyone, anywhere, whoever they may be, seeking to see if there is anyone who could justly condemn God's people in light of the fact that Jesus Christ has died for them. Now these words here, if you're taking notes, these words in this last section of Romans chapter 8 really are the apex of this entire epistle. Now, these words are tremendous, and what they do is to give us who are Christians great confidence in our standing before the Lord. Now, in this last section of Romans chapter 8, 
What the apostle does is to put forth six crucial questions which we will consider together throughout this day. Here he sets forth six vital matters which are all connected to our eternal security in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will consider five of them this morning and one this evening, the Lord willing. And so as we come then to our a passage in view for today, I ask you to please note with me first in 31a, Paul's opening question, his opening question. Look again at what he writes. He asks, 31a, what shall we say to these things? Now there's much uh, discussion among the uh, commentators and the scholars as to how far back Paul's thinking goes here when he asked in the first part of our verse, what shall we say to these things? In other words, uh, the question that the scholars and the commentators wrestle with, is Paul thinking about the things which he has been writing of going all the way back to the first chapter in this book, or is he thinking more remotely in the immediate context of Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. Now personally, in my own studies of the passage, I'm more inclined to take Paul's question here in view of what he has been speaking of in the immediate context. Here his question in 31a uh, seems to be that in view of the fact that we who are Christians know that our God is going to work all things together for our good, and that he has planned our uh, salvation even from eternity past, and that in time he will bring that salvation to completion, for as we have already seen, he has foreknown us, and thus he will justify us in the end. Paul is asking now that because of all of these things, what then, or more literally, what therefore ought our response to be in light of these things? Things. And so I ask, brethren, if we take Paul's question in connection to the immediate context of his words, what is the only appropriate response that we should give to God? Answer, praise be to your name. What shall we say to these things? That God's going to work all things together for our good and that God has foreknown us and predestined us and called us and justified us and that he in fact will glorify us. What then shall we say to these things? Answer, glory be to your name. Amen? What shall we say to those glorious salvific truths? Now of course, of course, if we want to Take Paul's question of what shall we say then to these things to cover every single thing that he has been speaking of all the way back from the beginning of this epistle, then I say that the same response is appropriate as well, right? I mean, church, if we start back in chapter 1 of the book of Romans, we will see that, chapter 1, we are the called of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are beloved of God, right? Uh, yes, in chapter 2, we will see that we who are Christians have circumcised hearts. In chapter 3, we'll see that Christ has made a full and final propitiation for our sins. In chapter 4, we'll see that we are Abraham's seed. In chapter 5, we'll see that we're justified by faith, and therefore we have peace with God. In chapter 6, if you're taking notes, we'll see that the old man has been crucified. In chapter 7, you and Iowa Christians will see that we, in fact, are married to Christ. And then in chapter 8, we will see there is therefore no condemnation for us who are in Christ. And so I say again, if we want to go all the way back to Romans chapter 1 and connect Paul's words in 31a with all that he's been written, what then shall we say in response to all that he's written in this book? Answer, praise be to God. Same answer. However you want to extend it, however far, I think the remote context is probably better to answer his words, but if we take the whole thing, the answer is the same. The answer is, glory be to God for so great a salvation. Can anyone say amen? Amen. 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 This is what we say to these things. Secondly then, Paul asks in our verse in view, in 31b, follow closely, if, or better translated from the original language, since God is for us, who 
can be against us. Question number two. Now, this of course is also a very important question, and I say this because it raises the idea, it raises the fact that indeed there will be, can be, might be, there will be people in this world who will be against us, right? Now, of course, if you're a true believer, then you know that this, in case, is true. This is the case. You know that this, in fact, is true. You know that as you live a godly life for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that people will be against you. It's very just part and parcel with being a believer. You know that in your own life, even as Paul himself knew it. And thus he says, for example, in 2 Timothy 4, in verse 14, that, quote, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Who could be against me, Paul says. Well, Alexander the coppersmith was against me. Again, this is the case for all of God's people as we seek to live according to Scripture. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer difficulty. Ah, but dear ones, notice with me in our passage that Paul does not say that since God is for us, who is against us, no, rather he says, look at it, since or because God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Many will be against us, but Paul asks, who can be against us? And so you ask, what's the point? Well, the point is, since God is for us, which means God is on our side, and since he is the all-powerful supreme being of heaven and earth, dear ones, I say that because this is so, in the ultimate sense, no one can be against us despite how strong they may seem. The point is, since our God, the king of heaven and earth, is on our side in the big scheme of things, no one, no man, no woman, no devil himself shall in the end be able to prevail over God's redeemed people. Glory be to his name. Now it seems to me that Paul here in using this language, who could be against us? It seems to me that with his Old Testament Jewish mind that he's thinking of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 46. Uh, Psalm 46, there the psalmist says uh, that the Lord of hosts is what? Is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There in that uh, section of scripture in the Old Testament, God's people were experiencing great difficulty. And so how then does the psalmist encourage them, uh, give them comfort in the midst of such a situation? Well, he does so by extolling God's great ability to protect them. Why? Well, it's because his ever-abiding presence was with them. We're in a difficult time, a difficult situations, enemies attacking us, etc. The point is, because God had covenanted himself to stand with his people, they could take heart knowing that no one would ultimately be able to defeat them. Well, dear uh, brother or sister here this day, guess what? The same thing is true for you as, as well. You see, whatever your particular trial might be, even this day, or, or what's to follow in the days ahead, friend, whatever it might be, you are always to remember that since God in Christ is on your side, he will always su support and sustain you all of your days, come what may. God is for his people. And what a beautiful statement that is. We should highlight it in our Bibles. Since God is for us, who can, in the ultimate sense, be against us? The answer is no one. Ah, but perhaps some of you here this day want proof Proof that God, in fact, will be with his people in this very way. I mean, what's the evidence that he gives us so that we can know for sure that regardless of our situations, come what may, God will stand with his people and that his heart is always for us? Well, the answer is plain. And it's set forth in 
verse 32a, look at the words there when Paul says concerning God our Father. You want proof? Here it is. He says that he, the Father, did not spare or withhold his own son, but rather he delivered him up. Which is to say in his predetermined plan to save his people, he delivered up Christ to be a sacrifice for our sins. Paul says he delivered up Jesus for us all, which is to say all of his for loved and predestined people as the context of the words show us. Well, in view of this, I ask you, dear church here this morning, what greater evidence, what greater proof could God Almighty give us to assure us of his love and his commitment toward us? What, what greater evidence could God give? How can I know God's heart is for me? How can I know he'll stand with me? Answer, he sent his son to die in my place. I mean, here Paul does not say that God did not spare angels or any other created thing, and, but that he delivered them up for us all, no. Rather, he says he did not spare his own son. Uh, the sense here in the original is his very own son. Uh, the language perhaps Paul, again with his Old Testament Jewish mind, is uh, going back to the account of Abraham there in the book of Genesis. Would you spare your own son, even your very own son? It's the language of God speaking to Abraham. But Paul speaks to us here about God and says that the proof of his love for us is that he did not spare his own son to die for us. He says that he did not withhold Jesus who was in his bosom. Jesus who is the centerpiece of heaven. And Jesus who is his co-equal and the very brightness of his own glory. Hebrews chapter 1. And so you see dear ones here this day the way that you and I can infallibly know that God is for us in the midst of all that we will go through in life is because he gave his very best for the very worst. The way that you and I can know this for sure is because he gave the altogether lovely one for us who are not lovely and deserve nothing but his eternal wrath. Well, in view of this, Paul asks his third question. When he writes in 30b, saying, How then shall he, the Father, not with him, that is, with Christ, also freely give us, the sense is, bestow upon us, out of his grace, all things, which in the context, the all things speak about all things referring to life and godliness. And so what is Paul doing here in this verse? Well, what he's doing is arguing from the greater to the lesser. Saying that since God gave the Lord Jesus Christ to be a sacrifice for our sins so that we would be saved, then surely he will also give us all other things that we need in order to persevere to the end. Christ procured our salvation, therefore with Christ, he will give us all things to the end that we will see that final salvation, even our glorification, realized in our lives. The point is, since God has done the greater, he will surely do the lesser. Uh, that's the point in the words. Or as one writer says, quote, since God has given the best, he will surely give the rest. That's what Paul is saying here. Well, the apostle has a fourth question that he puts forth in verse 33a. When he says, note the words with me there in your Bibles, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who shall bring a charge against God's chosen ones? Now, here in these words, uh, the Apostle Paul is bringing us back into the courtroom scene uh, that he had us in back in the 
earlier chapters of the book of Romans. Here the idea is that Paul is boldly challenging any person, anywhere, whoever they might be, to bring a judicial accusation against any of God's elect, God's chosen ones, that is to say, those who are the called according to his purpose, as Paul spoke of in verse 28 of this chapter. Uh, here Paul says that since Jesus legally stood in the place of his people with their sins upon himself and made a full atonement to God on their behalf, he asks now who on the final day of judgment could legitimately accuse them for their sins? Paul is challenging the whole moral universe with this question. And so church, I ask you again, what's the answer? to this question. Well, what's the answer? Well, the answer is no one, right? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is there's not a single person in heaven or hell who can do this. And this is because Christians have been completely forgiven of all of their sins through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, as Paul says back in Romans chapter 3. Well, brethren, uh, just as a side note here, but certainly connected to all that I'm saying, this then is a glorious result of the gospel, right? Who should bring a charge against God's elect? Answer no one. It's a glorious result of the gospel, which has saved our souls. And this is why, again, Zinzendorf can say, Bold shall I stand in thy great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absolved from these I am, from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Now, dear ones, this is the fact of the matter. And judicially, legally, in the courtroom setting, this is because Paul says next in our verse, look at the words, it is God who justifies. Why is it so? It is God himself who justifies. Paul says here that since the judge of all the earth has already completely accepted Christians through the sacrifice of his son Jesus, nothing or no one could ever change this fact. It is God who justifies. And brethren, I say, God's verdict about us is final. It is permanent, and thus there is absolutely no court of appeal or higher tribunal that exists which could ever overturn God's justifying verdict for his people. Glory be to his name. Christian God declared you not guilty the moment you put your faith in the finished work of Christ, legally in his ledger in the quorum of heaven, the moment you believe not guilty, and then you were credited with the positive, impeccable righteousness of Christ. And God is not a man that he should lie. And he declared you not guilty through faith alone in Christ alone. And because it is God himself who justifies, nobody could justly condemn us who are Christians. Now that, dear ones, is good news, right? Uh, that to me is the greatest news in all the world. No condemnation, now or forevermore, for us who are in Jesus. Well, as Paul continues his courtroom setting, he has one last question in verse 34a of this chapter. Whereas in the previous verse he asked, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now he takes this matter one step further. In again pointing us to the final day of judgment, 
And here he says in 34a, look at the words, who is he who condemns? Not just brings a charge, but now condemns. And so again, the answer to the question, clearly in view of all that Paul has already said, the answer is no one, right? And the answer is no one can justly condemn God's people for their sins. And why is this? You might wonder, well, the apostle in our verse puts forth four very clear reasons for this. And each one builds upon the other. Why, Paul, is there no one who can condemn us? 34b, number one, it is because it is Christ who died. Reason number one, why can no one condemn you, dear Christian? It is Christ who died, that's why. Think about the word Christ coming from Paul's mouth in this setting. It means Messiah. Why can no one condemn me? Because Messiah has died. Really? Messiah was supposed to die? Yeah. That's what the Old Testament tells us. I thought when the Messiah comes, there'll be peace on earth. Not in his first coming. No, his first coming, he came to deal with sin. And thus Isaiah could say in Isaiah 53 that when Christ came the first time, he would be wounded for our transgressions. That he would be bruised for our iniquities, that the chastisement of our peace would be upon him, and that by his stripes we would be healed. Why can no one condemn the one who's put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it's Christ who died. Messiah has made a full, free, and final atonement for all of his people. Praise be to his name. Reason number one. Why the Christian in the final day would never be condemned to hell? It is Christ who died. It is Christ who died. It is Jesus who, having stood in the room instead of his people, cried out saying, It is done. It is accomplished. I have paid the penalty of my people in full. Praise be to God. That's why, number one, dear Christian, we can never be condemned. But secondly, Paul now in showing us another reason why we can never be condemned by God in the last day, says in our verse, look at it, secondly, building on this, that Christ is also risen. Step number two. Not just the cross, but now the resurrection. And so what's the point? The point is this, that since God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that he fully accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. That's what the resurrection proves. He made a full atonement for us. For if not, Jesus would still be in the ground. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we would still be in our sins. Ah, but then Paul goes on to say, but Christ is risen. He is risen as the validation from God Almighty that he's accepted his atonement as our substitute and surety. Here's God's receipt to all mankind that the Lord Jesus Christ made satisfaction for the sins of sinners there upon Calvary's hill. Jesus' resurrection proves that this is the case, and thus Paul could say in Romans 4 and verse 25 that Christ was delivered up because of our offenses and that he was raised because of or on account of us being justified. Well, not only this, Paul has a third step as further evidence for our security in Christ. When he says, look at the words that this Jesus is even at the right hand of God. You see the steps, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and now Jesus is at the right hand of God. And so you ask, what's the point? Well, the point is this. Because after Jesus' death in our place and resurrection, God the Father placed him as it were at his right hand. In doing this, he gave Jesus the highest place of honor in all the world. And by that act, he signified that his work on the earth was completed and accepted. The point is, because of Jesus' accomplishment for us at Calvary, God the Father, as it were, gave his Son the best seat in the house. 
And thus the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10 and verse 12 that Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sin forever, what did he do? The writer says he sat down at the right hand of God. How do I know that my security in Christ is good? How do I know that God won't overturn it or it won't be overturned by another? Answer, Jesus died. Uh, Jesus rose again and Jesus is now sitting at the place of highest honor at the right hand of God. Well, fourthly then, just so that you and I who are Christians can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we who are believers can never be condemned by God for our sins against him. Paul says in our passage that Christ also makes intercession for us. The fourth matter. And so again we ask, what's the point? Well, the point is that although Jesus' work of atonement on our behalf has been completely finished, there at the cross. Nevertheless, in glory, he continues to plead the merit of his blood to the Father for the sins that we commit at the present time. Pleads the merits of his blood, so says the hymn writer. The point is, our heavenly advocate, Jesus, continues to present the value of his sacrifice to the Father, which sacrifice was completely accepted by the Father. And thus the writer of Hebrews says again, Hebrews 9 and verse 12, that not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, Jesus entered the most high place. Once for all, having done what, he says? Having obtained eternal redemption. And so here then, in verse 34 of our chapter, the Apostle Paul has put forth four marvelous facts, which, as I said repeatedly, all build upon one another. And what are they meant to do? They're all meant to give us, who are Christians, great security concerning our standing before God in the Savior. One, two, three, four. Four great pillars that you and I, who are Christians, can rest in all the days of our lives. Each one shows us why it is that we who are God's people will never be condemned by God. And again I say, praise be to God. Four glorious truths which should deeply encourage all of our hearts. And so here then, is where we end the exposition of these most magnificent words. Of these are words which come upon the heels of all that Paul has been speaking of in the previous verses. Here we have his words of triumphant faith. And so having considered them together, I want to begin to close by applying some of this passage to us, firstly, who are believers in this place. Uh, to those of you here this day who are the redeemed of the Lord, those who can receive no just accusation in the final day of judgment, what can I say to you? Well, there are three things. And the first is this. Listen, dear Christian. Number one, our text for today calls you to trust God. To trust Him with all your heart concerning your present and future standing with Him. And that if you ever have any doubts about this matter, then you are to go back to the cross of Calvary and remember that the Father did not spare His own Son for you. And you know, sometimes there are true Christians who, who wrestle with this matter of their standing before the Lord. Uh, some Christians have a great assurance, others do not. And so if you're one of those people here today who wax and wane regarding this whole matter, I say, dear friends, that if you ever doubt you're standing before the Lord your God, you are to go back to the cross and remember that it was there where the Father did not spare His own Son on my behalf. It was there that He made His Son's soul an offering for my sin. It was there where Jesus cried out, It is done! It is there where God satisfied His own justice on my behalf by pouring His 
wrath and justice on the place of his son in my room instead. And so, dear Christian friend, you who may struggle with this matter of assurance, if it ever is so with you, go back to the cross and remember all that God in Jesus Christ has done for you. But secondly, our passage calls you, dear believer, not only to trust in God, but also to resist the devil. To resist the devil with the truth of our passage. Why? Because the devil loves to rob God's people of their assurance. For is he not called in scripture the accuser of the brethren? The book of the Revelation. He seeks to accuse Christians to God night and day. He seeks to accuse us in our own consciences. You remember Luther there, he's in Wittenberg and the devil as it were was on his back and he wouldn't get off his back and he's just condemning him as it were in his own mind. And Luther, you know, in the old days he had like a little inkwell, he dipped the pen in there, you know. And it says that Luther, Luther was so frustrated at the devil that one day he said, get out of here, Satan, as it were. And he picked up his inkwell and he threw it at the wall so as to hit the devil, as it were. And I hear that if you go to Germany and see where Luther was, there's still the stain of the inkwell, the ink that was in it, on the wall. The accuser of the brethren. And this is what Satan loves to do. He loves to accuse us. Oh, we fall into sin and our conscience smites us. We feel guilty. Well, what do we do then? Well, we confess our sins and we know that God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do what God calls us to do. But the devil comes and says, ah, look at what you've done. You're no Christian. You've got no grounds of acceptance with God. Look at what you've done. So what do we do? We reply back and say, ah, oh, devil, it's all true. But my getting into heaven is not based on what I've done. It's based upon what Christ has done. Get thee hence, Satan. We resist the devil with the truths of our passage. We set forth the four pillars. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is at the right hand of God. And Christ is making intercession for me. Be gone, you evil foe. We need to resist the devil. As Peter says, how? In the faith. Or we could take the preposition, with the faith. With the word of God. With the truths of the gospel. We shut his mouth. We do what Jesus did there in Matthew's gospel. When the devil came seeking to tempt the second Adam so that he might fall like the first Adam. A one was in the garden and the devil tempted him and he fell and we fell in with him. But then there was another garden as it were another paradise and there was a, a a second adam the last adam our great hero our great champion and when the devil came to him again you see the the parallels uh, jesus resisted the devil how did he do it with the word of god with the word of god and in a sense we could say that adam could have done the same thing because he had god's word eve could have done the same thing because she had god's word did God really say X, Y, and Z? She could have replied and said, no, God said this. Leave me alone, Satan. But Jesus used the word of God. He used scripture. Turn the rock to stone. Jesus quoted scripture back to him. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word, every harema that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how you do spiritual warfare, brethren. That's how you resist the devil when he seeks to shoot a dart of doubt into the abode of your thinking. You put on the helmet of salvation or the helmet which surrounds your mind with the truths about salvation. Ephesians chapter 6. And the truths about salvation is that God having saved me will keep me saved to the end. That God, having justified me, has accepted me once for all time because of the work of Jesus in my room and in my stead. That's how you, that's how I, that's how we resist the devil with the truths of our passage. Thirdly then, our passage calls us who are Christians 
Not only to trust God, not only to resist the devil, but now to praise the Lord Jesus Christ for securing our eternal security, having done everything that we need to be accepted by God. We need to praise Christ. Because as you've seen, as you've heard, when Paul talks about the matter of us not being condemned, he focuses on one individual. It is Christ who died. Christ who has been raised. Christ who is at the right hand of God. And Christ who makes intercession for us. Brethren, our standing before God is based on one, capital O. His name is Jesus. And I say that in this place, because this is so, we ought to praise and bless this wonderful Savior all of our days. This is why Paul can say to the Colossians, Him we preach. Him. We preach a person. We preach the Savior. The gospel, the good news, is not so much a what, it's a who. The gospel is Christ. It's the good news about his doing and dying and rising on our behalf. The very thing we're going to celebrate in a few minutes together. It's about Jesus Christ the Lord and therefore I say may he get all the glory and praise from us his redeemed people. Amen. May we love this Jesus and may our hearts go out to him afresh. As we partake of the elements before us in just a few moments. I close then with a word to any non-Christian in this place. To you who don't know the Lord, what can I say to you but simply this? Listen, until you go to Jesus Christ by faith alone, so as to be forgiven of all of your sins, God is not and cannot be for you. Is not and cannot be for you. Again, the language of Paul, 31b, since God is for us, Christians, he's for us, why? Because of Christ. But if you're not a Christian, if you haven't gone to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, my dear unsaved friends, the point of the matter is God is not for you. He's not for you. Matter of fact, he's against you. And if he's against you, who can be for you? Think about that. Let that just sit in your mind for a moment. God is against you. The very God of the Bible is against you, is set against you. As you continue to stay away from Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. God's wrath is upon you. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God is not for you, friend. God is against you. Because you continue to stay away from Him and His glorious offer of forgiveness with Him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You continue to stiff arm God, as it were, And as you continue to do that, he continues to be against you. Friend, let me just tell you that if there's one person in all the world that you don't want to have against you, it's God. It's God. You want God to be on your side. You want God to be with you. And the only way this happens is when you fly to Christ by faith, repenting of your sins against God. And putting your faith in his accomplished work at the cross of Calvary. And so this day, if you want God to be for you, if you want God to be your heavenly father, if you want to be reconciled to him, if you want to know the forgiveness of your sins, then go to Christ by faith. This day, 
Or right there in your seat, whoever you are, if you don't know God. Say, I don't want you to be against me. I don't want to be at war with you anymore. We've seen it in the earlier chapters of Romans. The carnal mind is enmity against God. I don't want to fight against you anymore. Oh, this is Paul on the road to Damascus. Jesus appears to him, and what does Jesus say? Paul, isn't it hard to kick against the spikes? Isn't it hard? Doesn't it hurt, Paul? Kicking, kicking, kicking. It's hard to have God against you, isn't it, Paul? And then Jesus converts him. And the first words out of his mouth, Lord, what would you have me to do? He's now a servant of Jesus. And my dear unsaved friend here this day, what... God would have you to do is go to his son. To, to own your sinnerhood before him. I, I've been a rebel against you, God. I, I haven't lived for you. I haven't cared for you. I've put myself before you. I've broken your commandments. I, I've lived with my highest thought being on myself, not you. I'm an idolater, O oh God. I'm a liar, O oh God. I'm a self-centered person, O oh God. I'm a fornicator, O oh God. I'm an, a homosexual, O oh God. I'm a drunkard, O oh God. I just, I come and I bring it all before you this day. I'm full of pride. I'm full of covetousness. Oh God, I just come to you with all of my sins. Because I know that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. All sin, whatever you've done. A big sins, a little sins as it were, whatever it is. You think of Paul, the great sinner. He can identify himself as the chief of sinners. God forgave him so wonderfully. And then God turned around and used Paul to be the great apostle for the things of the gospel. And so whoever you are here this day, friend, until you know Christ, God will remain against you all of your days. But today is the day of deliverance. Today is the day where all of this could change in an instant. You call upon God, God says, I'll hear you. You call upon me, with all your heart, God says, I'll hear you. You want to be right with God, young person, older person, whoever you are, anything in between? Then you go to him through Christ. God, I want to be right with you this day. Would you grant it to be so? I repent of my sins toward you. And I believe on Christ, who died as the just one for the unjust ones that he might bring them to God. Might it be that some of you this day would be reconciled to God? That you, as it was said of Abraham of old, will become the friend of God. No greater thing in all the world than to have God as your friend, to have God as your heavenly Father, to have God as the one who leads and guides you all of your days. Oh, friend, I say there's nothing greater in the world. But there's nothing worse in all the world. And to know that God is against you. That spiritually speaking, he is your great opponent. My dear non-Christian friend, I beseech you this day with all that I have. Turn from your sins and be reconciled to God through Christ and through Christ alone. Let us pray. Father, we are blown away, as it were, by the great truths that you have in your word. We're so thankful for the clarity of all of it. We ask, O oh God, that as we come to partake of the Lord's Supper this day, 
that you will encourage our hearts in the midst of it, that these elements will be to us very real this day as they symbolically point us to the finished work of Jesus in our place. O oh God, seal then these truths to our hearts. We ask and pray this all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.